I'm going to go over the updates to the NCCN guidelines. We just released the genetics familial high risk assessment breast ovarian pancreatic guidelines on September 7th of this year. And they're earlier in, in the year, so earlier in the summer, the colorectal genetics guideline group had also released their guidelines, which I will touch upon, but mainly I wanted to go through some of the highlights of the breast ovarian pancreatic guidelines. So what you will see here is this, I consider this the table of contents. So when you look at this table of contents, uh, what you can see is there's a lot more granularity. Uh, so what we tried to do here is if you are looking for a specific topic area, it should be pretty easy to find. These are all live links and you can go directly to whatever section you're looking for as an example, you know, tumor genetic testing, potential implications for germline testing is uh, on its own page, circulating tumor DNA, again, on its own page. So we fleshed out the table of contents a lot. And again, this is just a bigger view of all of the different components here that we have. And I can tell you that there were a lot of updates that went into uh, these sections. The other thing I wanted to go over, and again, these are long guidelines. It's, they're 140 pages when you download the PDF. So what I've done in this slide is I have, or at the top of the slide is I've given the page number. So it's eval A um, five of 10, but the page number 14 out of 140, that's actually the PDF. So it's on page 14 um, for reference. So some of the salient points that I wanted to mention, there's a lot of them. So I just tried to pick out some highlights. Um, one of the areas of um, confusion or inaccurate information is um, in the oncology world, sometimes, you know, if tumor sequencing is done, is there a need to do germline testing if nothing was found on the tumor testing that was suspicious? And the answer is yes. So we clearly outlined this in the guidelines. So what we say is tumor-only sequencing may fail to detect about 10% of clinically actionable pathogenic, likely pathogenic germline variants. And the reason for that we all know is because you're going to miss the large rearrangements, the deletions, duplications, etc. So again, if someone is at high risk, tumor-only sequencing is not enough. Uh, the other thing that we highlighted here is, again, we know that um, circulating tumor DNA is something that is, it's a field that's rapidly evolving. So we called, called this out and kind of said sensitivity, false positive rate, and positive predictive value needed uh, to derive clinical utility are needed to derive clinical utility and determine clinical validity. And because these are not fully defined at this point, and there is potentially some psychological impact, which remains undefined at this point in time. So again, kind of bringing caution to, you know, this is a rapidly evolving field. It has potential to be beneficial but right now. We just don't know enough. Uh, what we also did, and again, this is on page CRIT2 or page 23 of 140 of the PDF. In the past, we had anyone, any female diagnosed with breast cancer at or below age 45, regardless of family history, regardless of pathological subtype was eligible for testing. We raised that age to 50. So anyone age 50 or below regardless of histopathology or family history, now qualifies for testing. We also updated uh, the multiple primary section where multiple primaries at any age, um, multiple primaries specifically of breast cancer at any age, uh, would qualify for testing. Now, on our gene table, again, this starts on page 34 of 140. Uh, for check to ATM, the age to start breast MRI screening in females was reduced from age 40 to age 30 to 35, making more females eligible for screening at an earlier age. For ATM, uh, 
we added emerging evidence for prostate cancer risk. But again, this is emerging evidence, meaning we at this point didn't make any guidelines or refer to any guidelines about any screening, surveillance, et cetera. Um, for check two, um, what we also have called out here is the risk for most missense variants are unclear, but for some pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants, such as the I157T variant, the risk for breast cancer appears to be lower and does not reach the threshold for management change. The reason this is important is, again, with this CHEP2 variant, it's pretty common in individuals of European ancestry. And here at Vanderbilt, we actually see this variant a lot when we're doing the tumor testing and it's an incidental finding. It raises the risk by 1.3, so 1.3 fold. So again, it's like a high risk SNP at this point in time. So again, I would caution acting on this like we would on other check two variants. So the missense variants are still it's an evolving area, but many of them don't seem to impart the same level of risk to lead to additional management actions. Um, for in terms of risk reducing salpingo oophorectomy for PALB2, we added consider RSO at age uh, over 45. This is consistent with the PALB2 practice resource that we had um, put forth in the last couple of years. The first author is Mark Tishkowitz, where we made the same sort of uh, recommendation. Um, and this is this consider is different from the recommendation we make for BRIP1, RAD51C, RAD51D, where we say recommend RRSO at age 45 to 50. Um, looking at um, uh, this page, BRCA1, two of three, uh, it's page 46 out of 140 in the PDF. What we also mentioned, and this again has been an area where there may be some confusion about, well, is HRT okay to give carriers? And what we clearly state here is BRCA1 and 2 after RRSO, HRT is a consideration for premenopausal patients who do not carry a diagnosis of breast cancer or who or have other contraindications for HRT. Again, putting it into the guideline is something that is based on the current evidence. And then the other thing that we are very excited about is we added a summary page. It's um, sum one to three, and really it's pages 54 to 56 of the PDF of the guidelines. And what we have here is a summary of all the genetics content across all NCCN guidelines with live links. So in the first column, you see NCCN guideline. These are all live links where it will take you to the first page of the guideline. But in the second column, which I think is super useful, what, it, uh, what we have is these links will take you to the table of contents. And we have already included what section to look at in the table of contents to take you to that guideline, uh, to the specific page where this information lives. And again, in the third column, what we have is a summary of the genes that are discussed in each of these other guidelines. Because again, for many of us, I think there is a lot of rich genome, uh, germline inherited cancer content that lives outside of the breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and the colorectal genetics guidelines but it's not always easy to find it. So we're hopeful that this information will be um, very useful. And again, I can tell you, I was speaking at the National NCCN conference last year and someone, one of the questions I got is, is there any information about inherited kidney cancer in the uh, NCCN guidelines? And there is actually a lot of information that lives in the kidney cancer treatment guidelines focused on inherited kidney cancer. So again, we hope that this will be a useful resource um, to find additional genetics content um, through NCCN.
Uh, what we also did was we removed from the guidelines um, ovarian cancer screening for BRCA1 and BRCA2 because there is no evidence at this point in time to support that it is reliable. NBN was completely removed from the gene table because the new data don't support it to be a breast cancer gene. And then we also removed use of tomosynthesis with annual uh, mammogram. Um, we just have the annual mammogram now. And then finally, this is my last slide. Uh, this is the at the end of the guideline. It starts on page 59. And really what this is, is a summary of the discussion, which is updated annually. And it is a really great resource to get the background information that informed the development and the updates to the guidelines. And again, the current version is from last year. So we're in the process of updating it, which will happen over the course of this year. But again, even the information from last year, um, many folks may find that useful. It's an easy way to get the information. Um, for the colorectal cancer guidelines, again, this has gotten quite a bit of press, but uh, criteria for testing colorectal cancers was expanded to offer germline multi-gene panel testing to all individuals diagnosed with colorectal cancer below age 50 and to consider testing for all others, particularly those with a family history or evidence of mismatch repair deficiency, but not restricted to these, just these patients. So again, you can see how this really broadens um, the guidelines here for colorectal cancer testing. 